can send a message to the waiting room folks that we will get started. Just one minute. I can do that. Okay, we're good on all cylinders. Okay, let folks in. So, at that point, I don't think he has a Okay, we are going to get started. Welcome everyone to this conversation with the extraordinary and visionary organizer and educator and author, Miriam Kaba. I'm Alice Kim, Director of Human Rights Practice at the Posen Family Center for Human Rights. And I'm so grateful to be sharing space with Miriam and all of you on the Zoom today. We'd love to see who all is in the Zoom room. So please say hello by dropping your name in the chat along with the city you're joining us from. And um, if you'd like organization you work with, please feel free to share links to your orgs as well. We want people on this chat to be able to find and connect with um, all of the organizations that are doing such great work. Um, I also wanna ask folks to take 20 seconds to complete this quick survey that will tell us who's on the Zoom um, and gives you the opportunity to share how we can improve Zoom events. Um, so that link will be dropped in the chat. So this event is organized by the Posen Center Human Rights Lab, the Center for the Study of Race, Politics and Culture and the Mass Incarceration Working Group at UChicago. I wanna thank uh, my co-conspirator, Tracy Matthews, Executive Director of the Race Center who co-launched the Mass Incarceration Working Group with me and the amazing team at the Race Center and Posen Center, Marilyn Richards, Tierra Kilpatrick, Michael Fisher, Noel Petrowski, Tommy Hagen, Lucia Gang, Madeline Wright, David Knight, uh, Kilroy Watkins, who is the Labs Community Fellow, and Darrell Washington, who is also the amazing TA for the class I'm teaching this quarter, Reimagining Justice in the Chicago Police Torture Cases. So over the last nine weeks, we have dived deep into the struggles for justice in the John Birch torture cases. We've had incredible sessions with torture survivors, including the incomparable Latanya Sublet, Anthony Holmes, Mark Clemens, Gregory Banks. We've read texts by and had classroom visits with folks who played an extraordinary role in past and present struggles for justice in the Burge torture cases. Um, last week, the class was enthralled, meeting and learning from movement lawyer Joey Mogul and uh, the co-founder of the Chicago Torture Justice Memorials and author of the Reparations Ordinance. And we have had our own resident experts, um, Kilroy Watkins and Eric Blackman in the class. A shout out to all the students um, in the class who have brought their full selves um, and challenged themselves and each other to think more deeply and critically about justice and abolition. So it is really fitting that we are ending the course by reading Miriam Kaba's 
new book, We Do This Till We Free Us, Abolitionist Organizing and Transformative Justice, um, a book that is truly a gift to our movement. And in the spirit of one of the titles in Miriam's book, that everything worthwhile is done with others, we have opened up today's class and our conversation with Miriam to the public. Um, I see we are here in good company um, and joining us, um, joining me as the co-moderator for this conversation is Professor Ruben Miller, who I have had the great pleasure of getting to know over the last several years. Ruben is an assistant professor of social work, policy and practice. His research examines life at the intersections of race, poverty, crime control, and social welfare policy. Ruben also has a new book out as well, a beautiful, a beautiful book called Halfway Home, Race, Punishment, and the Afterlife of Mass Incarceration. Um, the two of us have really been engaged in this question around um, the role of the university in ending mass incarceration since Kathy Boudin came and visited us a couple of years ago and asked us to really think deeply um, about this question. So we're excited to be having this dialogue with Miriam about Chicago reparations, justice, and abolition. And to introduce Miriam, I wanted to direct folks to Miriam's website, miriamkaba.com. You can read all about all of her fabulous work there. But instead of reading Miriam's bio, I thought I'd play a photo montage that I made with Maya Shenwar, Aislinn Pulley, Britt Schulte, Dio Harris, and Mayadette Patitucci in 2016 for the annual Women and Femmes to Celebrate ceremony. This is a celebration that I believe was founded by Miriam Kaba um, to honor unsung sheroes in our movement work. 2016 was the year when Miriam left Chicago after nearly two decades of community building and creative organizing. And we wanted to honor Miriam's work. Um, anyone who knows Miriam knows that she will not be photographed, though she will on occasion allow photographs that do not feature her face. So we compiled these images into this video as our tribute to Miriam. So we'll play this now.
made and continues to make an indelible mark on the political and cultural landscape of Chicago and the nation. The words I wrote in 2016 at our send off for Miriam hold true today with integrity, grace, savvy, humor, humility, and sheer inventiveness. Miriam has helped us see that another Chicago is not only possible, but she is already on her way. Chicago is a better place because Miriam lived, breathed, and organized here. So with that, I warmly welcome Miriam Kaba. Okay, first of all, <laughs> I'm going to kill you. That's number <laughs> one. That's how we begin the situation. I, um, I am so... Oh, I'm just uh, just seeing a lot of those images, seeing my dad in there. Ah, oh, um, I'm I'm so moved. Thank you so much um, for inviting me and for having me and for co-struggling with me all these years. Um, I really appreciate you. So, those are my opening words. <laughs> We are so thrilled to, to have you here um, as part of this, this conversation. And I really wanted to begin by asking you to share a bit about how you came to this work and how you became an abolitionist. Yeah, um, so I think like most everybody that I know, um, it was a process for me. And yes, um, like a slow becoming. Um, my activism, had initially centered around racial justice. And I was keenly focused on state violence as a teenager growing up in New York City. I always say I started my first organization when I was 15 years old. Um, and as I moved on to college, I gained an understanding of myself as kind of not just being black, but also being a woman. Um, and I got more interested in an analysis and also a lived experience of myself as a gendered person. Um, I also had a couple of traumatic life experiences a couple of years before going to college that made me want to better understand gender violence, um, both for myself and also for my communities and with my communities. When I finished school, when I graduated college, I went to McGill University um, and I taught for a minute. Um, and then I started working in a domestic violence organization in New York City that um, is called Sanctuary for Families. The organization still exists. It's the largest private domestic violence organization in New York City still. Um, and then I moved to Chicago in 95. And I continued with my anti-gender based violence organizing work, both as a volunteer. And then I worked as a worker at a local domestic violence organization, which was at the time called um, Friends of Battered Women and Their Children and is now called Between Friends. All that time I was becoming more and more, I don't know, maybe it's disillusioned with the funded so-called mainstream anti-rape and anti-domestic violence fields. Because really honestly, at that point, by the time I came involved with the work in the late 80s, early 90s, um, it had moved from being a movement to being a field. And in the mid 90s, I had begun to study and practice restorative justice. Took my first restorative justice training, I think it was in 96. So it wasn't kind of a huge leap for me to move to PA, to move to like embracing a PIC abolition politic after I had started to learn about restorative justice. Mm -hmm. um, it was in the late 90s and the early 2000s that I grew into a PIC abolitionist politic, really thanks to critical resistance um, and everybody involved with CR, um, who I learned a lot from as well as Insight Women and Trans People of Color Against Violence, among other formations. Those are the kind of containers and places and generators of knowledge and organizing uh, formations that help me to see myself as an abolitionist, not as an identity, but as a politic that I subscribe to and as a practice for me. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much, Miriam. Ruben, do you want to ask the question? Yeah, I do. I, 
I, I'm thinking a, a couple of things. So your last comments make me um, think about some of the strengths and dangers actually. So this is a little, a little bit sli slightly off. The, um, just thinking about what you just said, like like the, 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 the DV work going from being a movement to being a field and the dangers of that. And it makes me think just right away about um, the popularity of abolition right now. Um, and I wonder if there are any, if there are any dangers in, in as, as things become institutionalized, as we begin teaching classes on it, as, 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 as people begin to specialize, uh, as, as, as more books are written, and this is of course a, a beautiful and powerful thing, it's, it's, it's changing the way we think, but I wonder if you see any dangers on the horizon um, just, just in, in, in abolition um, becoming a field. Hmm. I, hmm, that's a good question. I don't think abolition will ever become a field. That's, that I don't think will happen because it's not centered on services in the same way that the DV kind of sexual assault stuff became service oriented and focused on hiring professionals to deliver those services. So I don't think that'll be the same thing. Usually people ask me about fear of co-optation, like of movement. Um, I, and I have to say like, you know, it's, it's lovely that more people care about PAC abolition now, or at least curious about it, but we're in no danger of becoming super popular yet. Like we're deeply unpopular. You know what I mean? Like most people are deeply resistant to the concept of PIC abolition. So I think we're a long way away from like becoming so popular that we become like on a Wheaties box or something like that. I don't think that's that's not happening anytime soon. I think the other reality that I have is that I really don't care so much about co-optation. Like I my whole interest in the work that I do is really to subscribe to Tony K. Bambara's notion that what you want to do is make revolution irresistible. I think our ideas are powerful. I want people to take on our ideas. Like I don't, I'm not a person who believes that like staying precious and having clubs is how we're going to win liberation for our folks. Um, and so as many people as possible who can take on these ideas and make them their own is what we're going for. Plus, I'm not worried about abolitionists. Like we're always, first of all, we argue all the time with ourselves. And I don't mean like ourselves, each other. I mean, just like ourselves, we're constantly changing our minds. We're constantly, cause we're looking at the world and understanding what's happening outside of us and being like, hmm, maybe what we thought two years ago wasn't really the thing. Maybe we gotta ask new questions. Maybe we gotta push ourselves in new ways so that you know, the way that people see, I see, I changed my mind, you know, like, and so I think, <laughs> I think the way that we see this is that since it's a practice and not just, not just a theory of, of change, we're going to constantly um, be iterating new ideas around PAC abolition and it's going, it's dynamic. And as new people take it on, they're going to bring their perspectives and they're going to shift it. And as more young people develop their not notions and ideas of it, they're going to take it on in a totally different way and remix it. And I'm excited. I'm looking forward to it. One of the moments of my life that I really was like looking forward to was the day that younger people started to think I was a sellout because I was like, oh, good. You know what I mean? Like that means they're pushing in a totally different direction. Like, I don't see, I don't, and because I don't feel personally attacked, because like, it's not personal. Like maybe people feel it's personal on their end. It's certainly not personal to me. So I was always looking forward to the day when people would be like, oh, you know what? You're counter-revolutionary or something. Cause I'd be like, oh great, that's a new terrain. You know, <laughs> they're coming up with something different. I would, I just want us to do that, um, to be in that, in that frame of mind. So for me, abolition is generative and that's good. And that means, yeah, they're going to try to co-opt some language. Yeah, whatever. Who cares? We're coming up with something new anyway, every day. Yeah, you know, I think that's a really good segue to my next question, which is about the Ram Rep Now campaign here in Chicago. Um, you know, as you know, um, Chicago Torture Justice Memorials introduced a reparations ordinance to the Chicago City Council in uh, 2013. And um, any movement behind um, that ordinance had been stalled, right? And then 
after Mike Brown was brutally killed by police in Ferguson, um, we saw the birth of Black Lives Matter movement and BLM um, really gave new life to our local reparations campaign for John Birch torture survivors. Um, and I know you were a pivotal leader and organizer in the Ron Rep Now campaign. And can you, can you talk, and you've talked about um, this campaign as uh, doing the work of making Black Lives Matter. Um, can you talk about what you mean by that? Sure. So I think I wanna backtrack for a second because I think um, it's important to note a couple of things about chronology. Um, because, you know, Trayvon Martin's killing and then George Zimmerman's acquittal in 2013 really catalyzed a renewed kind of movement against the violence of policing. And the ordinance was put into uh, the city council in 2013, but it didn't, it wasn't necessarily connected to the, um, to the kind of organizers who were gonna push for a di like a different way of addressing the violence of policing in the same way. By the time um, in May of 2014, um, Dominique Franklin uh, Jr. Damo was killed by the Chicago Police Department. Um, and we had already begun to organize ourselves for a response to that in June of 2014 when we launched that uh, kind of modern version of We Charge Genocide, this intergenerational multiracial space um, centering the, the experiences and the, the ideas of young people of color, particularly young black people. By the time Mike Brown was killed and left under the hot sun for hours in August of 2014, there was already a mobilized base of young people of color in Chicago who were ready to push for something else like something different than calling just for the indictments and the body cameras and everything else. I think that's really critically important because it wasn't just like, it wasn't the external call just from what happened in Ferguson. It was that there were already some young folks, particularly young black and brown people in Chicago who had been activated by the killing of their friend and their, their peer and could then be like take on this work in a different kind of way. But anyway, getting back to your question, the center of it, um, in December of 2014, I had read this Q&A with political philosopher Joy James in the New York Times. She'd been interviewed for this piece in this place called The Opinionator. I'm gonna just quote a little bit of what she said because that was what got me thinking about Black Lives Mattering because we make them matter. She says in here at some point, Black Lives Matter. My students who have visited Ferguson tell me that this statement of fact was introduced into our shared language by women who understand the lives of their communities as crossing gender boundaries and traditional roles of political leadership. And then she says, Black Lives Matter because we make them matter. And I found those last words to be so profound because like, what did it mean to quote, make Black Lives Matter in the context then of a reparations fight, which is your, your, you know, the gist of your question. So I went back and was thinking about this, um, about kind of what, what that meant. And I had posted on my blog on January 15, 2015, this, this point, which will speak to what your question says, which was, I wrote, my goddaughter recently asked why it is important to pass this reparations ordinance. I gave a number of reasons having to do with fairness, restitution, decency, morality, and more. Above all though, I told her that it would be one way to concretize the meanings of Black Lives Matter. And then as a political philosopher, Joy James has said, Black Lives Matter because we make them matter. Insisting that Black people who are tortured by the state be compensated for this harm is one way that we can make Black Lives Matter. As protesters around the world have taken to lying down in public spaces, staging die-ins, I've been uncomfortable and mute. I've been screaming inside though, 
The system already wants us dead. Living is resistance. For me, the reparations ordinance is a memorial for the living. The ordinance's stubborn insistence that people, no matter what they have done, should be compensated for torture is a little earthquake. It shakes up and reconfigures the normalization of punishment. To say that the state needs to formally apologize for harm done is important too. At City Hall today, survivors of John Burge's torture will once again speak of it loudly, publicly, and with courage. And for those of us who are there to listen and demand restitution, we will sing. It's a live-in. Join us. So that's, I wrote that on the day that we were, we had organized the sing-in at City Hall. I remember, I was, yeah. I remember that. Yeah. Um, and so that's really, to me, expressing what I think is true, which is that it is in the doing of life that we make our lives matter. And that making is about creativity and it's about imagination and it's about persistence and it's about living. And I felt like the reparations ordinance was a memorial and a monument to living. And that's what I want black people to be doing is to live, to live, to live in our ordinariness, not our black girl magicness, to just be allowed to be ordinary in the world and not have to be extraordinary. That's really the, the gist of it for me. It always has been. And, you know, I, I thought that fighting for the reparations ordinance was really important um, for making a statement about that, about the living. Thanks for that, Miriam. I mean, that's just so beautifully put. Um, I, before I kick it back to, to Ruben, I just want to ask you to, to talk about the intergenerational character of the reparations fight, because I think you've also spoken about and um, written about that so eloquently, right? Looking sort of into the crowd when we were at City Hall, when we were um, at the Chicago Temple, when yeah. We were at all of our various spaces or the silver room, right? When we had our celebratory party on, on May 6, 2015 um, and seeing sor torture survivors and you know, young activists sort of you know, side by side co-struggling. Um, can, you, can you say a word about that? Yes, that was so critically important to me and we definitely wouldn't have won without that in my opinion. Um, and the reason why is because like we actually do need everyone not everyone in the world. We just need like a mix of people to fight together in order to win. And I saw that, I saw that on multiple levels, like on the, you know, this was a multi-generational, multi-racial, multi-everything, multi-gender, multi-everything, uh, you know, campaign. Um, and I think that the beauty of, I think that the young folks who were involved who had not been born when these people were being tortured and imprisoned, who learned about this work through their struggle to create a little bit more justice, um, brought new ideas and creativity and, ide and thought. And the folks who'd been around like you, me, Joey, others for a long time doing work, organizing, and then folks who were older than us, and many of the torture survivors are older than us, right? Like the generation above us, all those folks, like we have particular was knowledge and we have the experience of having seen things before that can be signposts and that can be like, yeah, you know, we kind of saw this happening before. Maybe this is not the way to go, um, you know? And then still being pushed by new people saying, no, we can go this way. So it was a push pull that I really appreciate. And, I, and I've always liked working with younger people. Um, I like young people more than I like adults. I like small people more than I like adults, like small people meaning children, always have um, for multiple reasons. You know, there's just, they're just more willing. You know what I mean? They're just more willing. <laughs> they're just more willing to change their mind, 
they're more willing to admit that they are actually don't know everything. They're, it's just a different kind of place to be. So I've always enjoyed working with younger people. And this was a great opportunity to really dig deeper in that. Um, and I've talked to younger people who say regularly that part of their experience, like, first of all, many of the young folks who were involved were new to organizing. And I'm like, when we won, I was like, I just want you to savor this moment because we actually lose a hell of a lot more than we ever win. So like really hold on to this feeling because it's so important to hold on to this feeling. You'll hold on to it for the rest of your life and it will make a difference. So, yeah. This is, this is beautiful. And, and uh, I'm, I'm glad to, to, to just be able to participate. I, half me just wants to eavesdrop on, on, on you two's conversation. It's, it's something about the bond that, that, that comes from the doing um, that's so powerful to me. But uh, I, you know, to build off something you said and to sort of move into the next question is you talked about the multi, you know, and it, something that feels more like an actual representation, like the, the mix of people who are doing this work. Um, and so, and so the, 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 the other side of that, of course, is, is, is the, the mono, you know, the idea like, like, like white men in suits or, or the black analog of that, um, straight black men in suits um, in leadership, looking a particular way, representing, um, you know, people will talk about this as respectability, but, 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 but yeah, but, but representing um, a certain um, polite, perhaps uh, understandable um, uh, a way to resist. Uh, and, and, and that's not, that's not what we see. We see, we see everybody um, in, it seems to me in the, the kinds of organizing that you've been involved in for, for, for quite a while, um, which, which, which leads me into a question about uh, the problem with looking for a very specific thing. Um, so so, so it, it leads me to think about the danger, the impulse to wanna find the right way to protest, the right people to, to take up for. You know, like, mm -hmm. like, like your work is for people we've thrown away, people we're afraid of. Mm -hmm. you know? um, and, 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 and I was gonna ask you, I wanted you to talk a bit about really the danger of, of, of the impulse to find a perfect victim. And, and so not to, not to take more time, I definitely wanna hear from you, but I remember when, when, your, your, when, when your essay on Centoya Brown, um, that's in the book dropped, I was teaching a class and we were at the, at, at, um, we were at, a, uh, at the section of this class that I teach race, crime and justice in the city, thinking about uh, criminal justice reform. And we were just at that moment thinking about the sets of exonerations that the Trump administration was engaging in and the celebrity based, you know, bring the bright and shiny to me and, 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 and I, will, I, will, I will set them free. I am, I am Messiah type. And I think I, anyway, in, in that essay, uh, you know, you, 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 you push us to, to think beyond um, uh, our, our, our impulse to find a sympathetic figure, our impulse to find the perfect victim. And so I, I'd love for you to, um, I, I don't know, maybe revisit uh, some some of your thinking with mm -hmm. that and speak to us about the dangers of, of, of our impulse to do that. Yes, um, thank you for that question, um, multi-layered um, and interesting to me um, because yes, um, I really thoroughly reject the concept that only certain people's experiences of harm should matter. Um, and because PAC abolition really explodes binaries, it talks about how we know that everyone can be harmed and everyone can harm others, and that it's really just a matter of degree. So one thing I so appreciated about the reparations fight um, was precisely that we didn't create a trope of, quote, innocent people or innocent victims. Some of the people who were tortured had harmed other people. Like, we have to tell the truth about that. But they shouldn't have been tortured. It's a both and. They deserved human dignity. We have to be able to talk about those things. And if you're in the work of dealing with violence, we have to be real about violence. Um, we have to be real. Like, people commit violent acts. And so what are we going to do then? When you rely on perfect victims, we're saying that some people are undeserving of our care. And I don't believe that people should be defined by the worst things they've done. I think that people can and do change all the time. 
And I think that people who survive harm are as complex as people who commit it. And often we're both. So what I, what myself and Britt Schulte, who um, co-wrote that piece about Centoya Brown, what we were saying and trying to make the point about was that we didn't have to exceptionalize Centoya in order for her to deserve to not be locked up as a 14 year old for doing something that was really in defense of her existence and her life. That we didn't have to keep her a 14 year old when she was now close to 30 in order to feel like that was what would get her empathy from people. That would make it worthwhile for them to advocate for her freedom. We've got to advocate for everybody's freedom, including people we despise. Like, this is critically important or people who've caused grievous harm because a lot of people have caused grievous harm and we cannot be focused on the non non nons mm -hmm. the non-violent non-serious non you know uh non deeply harmful right like we we have to take up the issue and i really appreciate for those of you who might be interested in this concept and this idea and how it applies in abolitionist thinking and theory i really would recommend a medium piece that was written by Micah Herskin last year, um, where he talks about three reasons advocates have to move beyond demanding release for nonviolent offenders. Um, and he, uh, I'm going to put that link in the chat. Um, but I really think people should read it, because he makes the point more eloquently than I have about like, a lot of people are locked up because they've done violent acts. But violence is also constructed in particular ways and understood in particular ways, depending on what your racial gender, you know, and class positions are. It's not just a thing. It's not like a just an objective thing. It's something that is consistently constructed. And for some people, and the people I work with in particular, particularly criminalized survivors, most of them are serving life without parole sentences because they killed people. Mm -hmm. right and yes they kill people because of lots of contingent reasons but that's why they're locked up and so if we start only focusing on the non non nons then they are necessarily confined and condemned to dying in prison and i'm just not going to accept that that's the you know i just don't think that's right and so we really have to be thinking a lot about um all of these things in order to be able to to do right by people on every end and to not reify a certain, you know, you could only be this way for us to care about you or to fight for your freedom. Um, I just think that's a real problem. Um, so I hope that that answers what you were talking about. And, you know, and the Centoya piece was also about the way that people think about sex work and um, the difference between sex work and sex trafficking, you know, and a lot more. Um, stuff, yeah. So I want to build on that question um, and ask you about the prosecution of killer cops. Um, this is one of the, the questions that we've been grappling with in, in, in the class and that I think that many folks um, uh, grapple with. Um, so for decades, activists um, uh, work doing work on the John Burge torture cases, um, focus their efforts on calling for the prosecution of John Burge. Um, and John Burge was ultimately um, charged, prosecuted and convicted, not for the crime of torture, um, but for obstruction of justice um, and perjury. Um, and he did serve four and a half years, four years, I think it was truncated to four years um, behind, behind bars. Um, so, it was really in that moment, I think, when John Burge was convicted and sentenced that some of us who have been doing this work really were faced with the reality that justice remained elusive um, for Burge torture survivors who continued to suffer um, the trauma of the torture that they had endured, continued to suffer from um, from the everyday reality of trying to trying to survive after having years taken from them. And then of course, there's also the reality that Burge torture survivors remain incarcerated um, today, continuing to fight um, for release for new trials. Um, 
so it was really a, a, a turning point for us when we turned to reparations, really to address um, the harm that um, survivors um, had experienced. Um, you have a piece in your book uh, about the prosecution of killer cops and, and the need in this instance also to move beyond um, the punishment paradigm. Uh, can you talk about your thinking on this? Yes, absolutely. Well, this is what, I mean, you know, this is one of the issues that gets me the most amount of people just losing it on me um, on a regular basis is, you know, you don't want the cops who killed so-and-so, what about their families? What about the, you know, and it's never calm. It's always really upsetting, you know, because people are very upset by that notion that I just don't think um, locking up individual cops is going to end any, the violence of policing at all. Like, I just think, I think, I think, I'm, I'm actually, this is borne out by life and history and the energy that communities do put into trying one cop, <laughs> when in fact, usually in the cases that we've seen, it's not just the one cop that was involved. It's like Derek Chauvin is on trial, but all the other officers who were standing right there as he had his foot on George Floyd's neck are there at work, do you know? So like, I just... And, and, and let, me, let me say this as well, like I understand profoundly as someone who has lost loved ones to people being violent and taking their lives, I understand profoundly the anger, the desire for vengeance, the desire for satisfaction of some sort that comes from that experience. I get it, like I get it just on a visceral human level, right? This is in part though, why I don't think we should be making laws named after one person because the notion of elevating one person's individual trauma into law is completely anathema to operating a civilized society. You know, my feelings are not, should not decide on what policies are the state enacts. Like, I just don't think that's right. I say that a little bit in the book, but um, I did write in the book about um, Darren Wilson and uh, the non-indictment of Darren Wilson um, starts on page 54. And I wrote about it before he was not indicted. And it was basically me saying, yo, I don't think he's gonna get indicted because we don't indict cops who kill people. Like that's just, they operate with impunity within the current system and structure of the law. That's one. But even if he did get indicted, what would, sh what would shift now for the struggle and the movement that we're engaged in? What would be different? right? Literally, like what would be different? And would necessarily everybody who loved Mike Brown feel satisfaction? No, we know that's not true. We know that's not true from the issue that happens with the reparations ordinance, where people didn't feel like, yes, this is it. He's in jail for four years. I'm so happy. In fact, people felt like, is this all there is? Mm -hmm. Right? So I just know that that's the case. So I'm going to say this because I think it's really important for me to note this. Um, in theory, I'm not against indicting individual police officers as a way to adjudicate and evaluate harms. I oppose imprisonment, not adjudicating harm. I just don't think that it's going to make a difference in ending the violence of policing, which is what I care about, which is I really want to end policing because I believe that policing is inherently violence. Um, and so I personally, Miriam Kaba, won't invest my energy in making such demands, okay? I, would, I will invest my energy in a fire Dante Servant campaign, which I did, immediately fire these cops without pension, immediately make it so that they are unable to ever get a job again in, as a police officer or a security guard or anybody carrying a gun and take their guns. Like there are other things we could be calling for that are also consequences. But I understand that most people have an interest um, in terms of, uh, they, they see this as like not enough punishment, not proportional to life, to the, nothing is proportional to somebody getting killed. Like what we want in terms of what justice looks like is for that person not to have gotten killed, okay? Like nothing else is going to be justice, right? And that's a struggle we have with each, with ourselves. And I want to continuously acknowledge vengeance, 
as not just something that people experience that make vengeance can feel good, by the way. We experience liminal pleasure by fantasies of what we will do to people who harm us. Do you know? Like that's real. Are we gonna talk about that publicly and be honest about it? That's part of why it's so hard to get rid of the notion of that. And what is shocking is not that people want vengeance. That's like normal human behavior. What's shocking is the people who have things experienced that har like grievous harm and choose not vengeance. Like we need a lot of studies about those people because I'm really interested in how in a culture steeped in violence and vengeance fantasies, how those people are able to ask for something different and something else, something that um, actually would potentially reduce real harm, you know? So yes, I think that what about the killer cops isn't the gotcha question people think it is. Right. <laughs> You're like, I don't have any problems saying, I don't think we should lock even killer cops up. I don't have any problems with saying that it's completely consistent with an abolitionist practice. Now, do I feel like I want people dead when they do bad things? Of course. <laughs> but that's not, you know what I mean? But that, my feelings shouldn't, per that's not the controlling factor here. It can't be. So, you know, I think that's what I want to put on the table for people. And I know that pisses people off and it, good, be mad. Like, honestly, be mad and interrogate why you're so angry. Like, I'm, and that, I'm not telling you not to be mad. Like, I think you should be as mad as you want to be. Like, I'm not trying to control your feelings. I'm just telling you that if you are going to be a PAC abolitionist, you're going to have to work that shit out. That's all. And again, can I also say that not everyone needs to be a PAC abolitionist? Right. Like, we're not evangelists here. I'm not trying to recruit people into the church of PAC abolition. You know, it's a politic and a practice. You choose. And if it doesn't apply for you and you don't want it, you don't need to have it. Right. That's, I, you know, and no shame here. No shame. Do what you feel is right. I'm just telling you, we're not going to get out of this mess with the current shit that's going on. <laughs> the current reforms are not going to get us there. You know? Right. Right, I'm going to kick it over to Ruben, and then we have a few questions in the chat, although I do want to ask you one other thing before we end. So, so because this is my precious last question, and, and, um, and you've already you've touched on, on some of the stuff I wanted to ask you about violence, uh, um, but you, 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 I think you, 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 you touched on that eloquently, but I, what I'd like to do is stay, stay in this place of, of um, you know, what seems to me, if, if I'm thinking about what you've said, and if I think, if, if I think about how I understand what you've written, um, you know, there's there's a set of there's there's an ethic that the principles that guide this world that you want to make, and that 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 principle isn't detached from um, experience. You know, experience matters um, certainly, uh, uh, but the 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 it's it's not about individualized feelings. It's not it's not about how how one feels in the moment, whether that be a feeling and a need for vengeance, which which drives our the modern impulse to punish. Um, uh, or, 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 or if it's sort of, it's, it's not, it's not about the individual. It's about something else. It's about the collective. And so I'm, I'm struck by the importance of, if, if I had that right, I'm, I'm struck by the importance of a collective political community. Um, and I'm struck by just generally before I think about, um, even abolition, just the importance of participation in any, any kind of movement for the, the for, for folks in that movement, for any vision of social change, but especially in what I take to be what I'm reading as your abolitionist vision of the future, um, or, or even the now and, and, and the future. Um, and so your discussion of collective care uh, really goes against, I think in very important ways, constant discussions that I hear quite a bit of self-care, um, which I read as calling attention to the individual, to the self as understood as located within the individual. And so can you, can, can you speak to the importance of collective care uh, and, and, and maybe to the importance of participation in, in, in movements? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think the short answer is that I think that collectivizing care is how we're going to actually survive. 
in the world. And I think if the pandemic hasn't shown that to enemy, but if you haven't experienced that in the last year, then you're never going to get it. Okay. Like if you didn't realize before that you needed to do what Mia Mingus has been telling us to do for 20 years, which is create pods and make sure that you have people in your life who can hold you both accountable, but also not hold you accountable, but so give you space to support you taking accountability and that you also need to be in a position where if you, um, you know, if, if they need support that you know who to call on, like this year has been a perfect encapsulation of the need to collectivize care. Because to be isolated out there in the world, you can be in the woods trying to do your thing by yourself. But every single thing that we do, like collectivity towards survival and cooperation for the common good are basic things, basic political notions and humanistic notions that transcend culture, time, and space. This has always been the case. Every aspect of your life that you think you're doing by yourself is bullshit. You are not. The clothes you're wearing were made by somebody else. The fruit you ate this morning was picked by somebody else. The fact that you're here on Zoom, somebody else is running. But like, there is nothing you're doing in the world that's just you alone. Now, in the West, this is a fever dream that people think they're raising themselves up from the bootstraps. And when they, but I'm like, who made the fucking boots? Like there is always somebody else who you're interdependent with, whether you choose to acknowledge it or not. So I think collectivizing care is critical. And that's why the only way we're going to actually be able to bring about an abolition, like get closer in an abolitionist horizon is by creating specific new social relations with each other that are healthier, that allow us to be able to be more truthful, and that give us space to take accountability when we harm people, which we inevitably will. I think that's what I would say about it. Thanks, Miriam. We have a couple questions in the chat that I'll um, read to you. Um, one is from Britt asking, how do you think social media is changing the abolition movement, um, folks understanding of it? And then another one from uh, Shivani asking about, um, what do we do when harmers have the language of accountability and use that to then avoid accountability? So those are two questions um, from the chat. And, and then I have a final question for you too. Sure, um, I think, you know, social media, like everything has, has shifted a lot of things. It makes it much easier for people to pick up on language, ideas, share ideas, um, and it, it can be very powerful, um, I think, if all you limit yourself to is social media, then you're going to be impoverished because you also need to engage, you know, other work and read with others and think with others and work with others in multiple kinds of ways. I am not someone who makes the distinction between online and in real life. Online and real life are the same. Okay, people have to get over that. Like this is the world we're fucking living in. And again, if this year did not make that rash hugely clear to you that you, your community extends way beyond your immediate tiny little circle of friends to people who probably you needed to reach out to who were three degrees removed, you know? And maybe you met them first through social media and they became part of your larger community. So I'm not somebody who's precious about that stuff or feels like, you know, oh, this, that, and the other, you know? Um, the question about accountability and uh, people avoiding it, yes, of course. I, I actually um, build into everything that people are going to avoid taking accountability <laughs> because yeah, what do we have it? Like we don't have a culture that supports people taking accountability for anything. Right. Your job, if something goes on, is to say you didn't do it. The shaggy, it wasn't me is actually praxis. Like, you know, like honestly that song, somebody should play it because it really is about what we're talking about, which is people refusing accountability. And also, it's actually cognitive dissonance and cognitive bias that makes it really hard for people to admit that they made mistakes. You actually shape your shift your life to explain your mistakes as because you don't want to ever see yourself as someone who's quote, a bad person. So it whatever mistake you make can't be reflective of that. 
So you come up with new stories to tell yourself about what happened when it wasn't actually what happened. Like there's a lot here that's just about social science and, psycholo and psychology and the fact that we don't have a culture that supports people taking accountability. And I'm sorry, we're not going to shift that until we make a culture as a community and a collective of folks that makes it okay for people to take accountability and makes it worthwhile. Because as it stands right now, if you say that you did something, what's hanging over your head is potential prison. <laughs> this is not encouraging in terms of telling people, yes, come forward, share, be honest, take, you know, people don't wanna do that for lots of really actually good reasons. And until we shift our culture, I think we're gonna keep having this happen. But what we can do in our own individual communities is that we can become people in our communities who actually say to people who caused harm in our communities that we want them involved in taking responsibility, taking accountability, making repair. That's what community accountability processes are all about. I find it really nerve wracking when I hear people outside of knowing anything about this stuff talking about it. Because you know what community accountability folks do? We name harm. We don't sweep it under the rug. You know, the reason you know stories about some of this stuff that happened is because we named those harms. It's because we actually take responsibility for working with people who caused grievous harm. We're not hiding it. We're not in a, you know what I mean? We're actually dealing with it as a community. We're also doing the hard, hard work of saying, you've got to try to make some repair here and staying along with folks sometimes two, three years to try to get that. So I, we are not the people who have the issues. The rest of the world does. Like we're actually trying to build something different and new and we're trying to create a culture of accountability in our communities. So everything that's happening right now where people love to say things like TJ failed, community accountability failed. Oh, really? You mean the recidivism rate of prison, which is 95% basically in some places, that's not quote failing, but you all are giving that billions of dollars a year asking no questions, not demanding that they do any effectiveness evaluations. But you mean to tell me you're unfund, you, the unfunded community group that's trying to do shit, you're like, show me, show me that you all know how to do, shut the hell up. I don't have anything to say to people who aren't going to take into account the institutions of the military, the police, the prisons, the surveillance industry, who get billions of dollars for the last 150 years, who've produced shit results, and y'all are mad at some community accountability folks going to, to doing stuff in the community? Like, what is, the, what is wrong with people? Like, honest to God, what is, like, what is wrong with people? <laughs> I don't understand it. I, I have conversations with friends constantly. I'm like, what are you asking for here? What are you talking about? Like, does this even make sense to you if you repeat it out loud? It doesn't. So we're, we're up against it, but we're doing what we can. Thanks, Miriam. You know, we're at time, but I do want to ask this last question. Sorry to the folks who uh, put in questions in the chat just recently that we're not going to be able to get to, but I want to ask you to speak to um, making connections and building relationships with folks who are incarcerated. Uh, last week, we had an event um, where Stevie Wilson, who I know you know, um, you know, gave a call to action calling on anyone who's doing work around mass incarceration, um, that if you're not actually in communication, in direct communication with anyone that is incarcerated, he said that you're not really doing the work. You need to be in direct communication. We need to build relationships with people um, who are inside. I know that this is part of your practice. It's been part of, you know, a practice that many of us um, uh, really uh, think is critical to building our movements. It's a, a refusal um, of the of carceral logic, right, to disappear folks. So can you can you say, can you talk about the value of building relationships um, with folks who are um, incarcerated? Absolutely, it's essential, you know? PAC abolitionists focus on forming and sustaining relationships with incarcerated people, with their families, with their communities and ours. And one way we do that often is through mutual aid. Um, and I encourage everyone who's listening today to join me in making nine solidarity commitments to and with incarcerated people. I just put a link in the chat. It's a bit.ly nine solidarity. 
and all of us can plug in and do something that improves the material conditions of our incarcerated comrades. If you're not already doing so, I hope you'll join in. I mean, I think that's the that's the bottom line. I don't think there's much more that needs to be said here. Um, and um, yeah, so you know, go and and find the nine solidarity commitments. It really takes you through very concretely some of the things that you can be doing, learning basics about incarceration and criminalization, writing at least six letters to an incarcerated person this year in 2021 with links to all the places that allow um, for connections to be made with people on the inside. So there's so many groups that do letter writing and you can connect with them. And I put a list of some of them here. Um, you know, there's all the ways that you should be also able to commit some funds to commissary for people who are locked up, find ways to join the phone zaps that are always being circulated on social media that it push for the improvement of conditions. So people in, in the inside are not tortured, you know, send books to incarcerated people, donate to bail funds, visit an incarcerated person at least once this year. And if you can't do it in person, do it through video, you know. Um, again, you know, there's so many things make send monthly emails to your governor, insisting that people be mass released under COVID and under all sorts of other kinds of pandemic, like, you know, the pandemic was the prison is something that people have been saying, and it's really true. So there's a million things you can do. You can house a recently incarcerated, a recently released incarcerated person in a vacant room or apartment or a house that you have. People who are re-entering society are still being punished, perpetual punishment. They can't get jobs. They can't go to school. They can't find, you know, a living space because of felony convictions. Like you can support, if you have a place, support people, invite them to do that. Um, you know, again, legally represent people in prisons and jails pro bono if you're a lawyer. I mean, there just cannot be more, the list is long. I put just some of the things down for people to connect. And I hope you'll do that because that's the, that the, the very basis. You know, PAC abolition is rooted in the black radical tradition and it's rooted in the traditions and the struggle of incarcerated people and criminalized people, you know? I mean, Angela Davis was incarcerated George Jackson was incarcerated. Asada was incarcerated. That those are the traditions that we build the modern PIC movement off of, you know. And the people who came before, you know, the socialist who loved to cite Eugene Debs. Debs was an abolitionist. <laughs> okay, anti-prison. He got incarcerated. His one and only book, right? What is it called? Walls and Bars. Hello. What was that? When was that? Like the 1920s and 30s or whatever, you know, like we, we have a long history to it's, this is not new. And if you look at the histories of incarcerated people, you'll know it's not new. Thanks so much for that, Miriam. I think that's a great way to close and end um, our conversation. And also in light of what you just said, I do want to give a shout out to Monica Cosby, who I know is on this call, Greg Banks, who is on this call um, as well, Latanya Sublet, um, also Anthonette um, Marsh Banks. So thank you for being community leaders and organizers. And we appreciate all of you for being here with us today. Now we're going to get to class. <laughs> yes, buy the book. We do this to be free, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs> all right. Thanks so much, Miriam. Thank you, Ruben. Thanks for having me. Thank you both. Thank you.